or there will be trouble. Of course, machines can't think as people do. The machine is different. Well, thank you very much for having me, everyone. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Jonah Cohen, and I do work at the McWayne Science Center in Birmingham. A quick question. Raise your hand if you've ever been there. Anyone? Anyone? Excellent. OK, put your hands up. We'll be sure we have out by the concession stand there a whole bunch of coupons for kids to get in free with their adults. So take some. We'll make more. Don't worry. We hope to see everyone sometime this summer. Now, before I start, uh, a couple sort of notes. Let me ask one question. Raise your hand if you have never seen the movie Jurassic Park. A couple people. OK, first, first, it's really good. Secondly, I'll try to avoid major spoilers. <laughs> and also a note about kinds of programs like Science on Screen, which I think is really wonderful. There are different opinions with some people about nitpicking the mistakes in the movies. Some people feel that's kind of a buzzkill thing that tries to get rid of the fun of everything. Whereas other people feel that's part of the fun. Uh, there are multiple websites that make lots of jokes about various mistakes in the movies. Uh, for example, on a note unrelated to paleontology, people who have seen Jurassic Park, raise your hand if you're familiar with the problem in the ledge scene. Couple people, okay. Watch carefully, we'll talk about that after the film. Okay. Now, at educational places like McWayne, we also see there's another opportunity. Very few things get people excited about something like seeing it in the movies. And science fiction, like Jurassic Park, is a good way to get people interested in real science and try to say, well, does that really work like it does in the movies? How, what's up with that? So we see that as an opportunity. For example, the exhibit we're going to be having this summer is about the science of superheroes and they're not exactly noted for obeying the laws of physics <clears throat> yes. but we can still use them for a lot of great real science education so to start with i could have talked for a long time about this movie but everyone wants to see it eventually i suppose so i wanted to focus tonight on one particular species the velociraptor Ah, uh, yes. I can see some people have already prepared their own talks about this part. Nice. The Velociraptor lived roughly 72, 73 million years ago. It was discovered in the 1920s. The name Velociraptor in Latin means speedy thief. The Velociraptors were part of a family of dinosaurs called the Dromosaurids, who were pretty successful in their time. This species was very obscure to the general public. No one had really ever heard of them until the book Jurassic Park came out, and then when the movie came out. And now, after T-Rex, they're probably the most famous species of dinosaur in the world, all thanks to Steven Spielberg. Thanks, Spielberg. <laughs> so a lot of times, as I can see, some people over there are thinking, were velociraptors really like the ones we're about to see on the screen? Well as is typical for the movies, in some ways, absolutely yes. And in other ways, absolutely not, not even close. And then there are in some ways, eh, maybe, eh. there are still a lot of things about dinosaurs, even very well studied ones that aren't known yet or aren't conclusively known or might even be impossible to figure out. So let me start out with the good. And this is true for a lot of the dinosaur species in Jurassic Park. When dinosaurs were first discovered and first became popular with the public, they were usually portrayed as these giant, lumbering, slow-moving lizards. The bipedal dinosaurs, those who walked on two legs like Velociraptor or T-Rex, were usually thought of as standing straight up and down just like a person and dragging big fat tails behind them on the ground. Uh, more recently it was found out yeah, no, that's not how their bones fit together. That was not true. Their posture or attitude was a lot more like a bird. Just like a bird, they leaned forward a lot, almost parallel to the ground, and had their tails held up in the air, sticking out behind them. That was to help them with their balance. And Jurassic Park was probably the first movie that did do an excellent job of portraying the dinosaurs that way. So, so far, so good, Spielberg. Mm. Also, 
There's a scene that some of you will see and some of you remember when Alan Grant is talking about the different similarities between dinosaurs like Velociraptor and birds. He mentions a bunch of things with their skeleton, like the special bones they had in the wrist, the way their bones are filled with a lot of hollow spaces, and everything he says in that speech is also very correct. Dinosaurs were closely related to modern-day birds, especially dromosaurids like Velociraptor. Grant also mentions that the word raptor also can mean bird of prey. So owls, eagles, hawks, those are all modern-day raptors, and they were a lot like the Velociraptors. Also, just as Mr. Grant saw, they did have a big hooked crescent-shaped claw on their feet that it's safe to say was probably really, really useful for killing stuff. So, so far, so good. There's a pretty good amount of stuff that is quite accurate in the movie. Then we get to the not-so-accurate parts there. Uh, perhaps the first thing is that it's kind of a weird name for this movie. The Jurassic era lasted from about 200 million years ago to about 145 million years ago, and it had been over for almost 70 million years by the time Velociraptor came around. <laughs> Velociraptor lived in the Cretaceous era, and the same thing is true of T-Rex and Triceratops and Gallimimus. Really, the only dinosaurs in this movie who actually lived in the Jurassic were Brachiosaurus and uh, also Dilophosaur. So why wasn't it named Cretaceous Park? I have no idea. You, got, you, you just got me on that there. Now, I have a coworker at the McWain Science Center who works with our fossil collection who, uh, if he was here, this speech would be lasting two hours just focusing on the scene where Dr. Grant and company are digging up a Velociraptor skeleton because that is laden with all kinds of errors about paleontology. Uh, to me, the most obvious one is that they're shown digging up a Velociraptor skeleton in the state of Montana, which is highly interesting because Velociraptor lived on the other side of the world in Mongolia. So, <laughs> missed it by that much. Also, when dinosaur bones turn into fossils, the organic parts, they're leached out as they're replaced by minerals. So, the content of fossil bones is pretty much the content of rock. So for that reason, ground-penetrating radar is not used to find fossils the way it's shown in this movie here. <coughs> Excuse me. Now there's also a scene, and this is popular in the public imagination for a lot of reasons, where everyone is very slowly brushing the dirt and the grit off the dinosaur bones, slowly exposing them. That's not how paleontologists do it either. If they find a bone somewhere in the ground that's partly exposed and they can say, all right, here's something we want to take a look at. They slowly and carefully find out where it is, get the parameters on how big it is, and then dig a whole gigantic chunk of the rock and earth out of the ground, put it on a truck and take it back to the lab to do the careful scraping away and separating the rock and fossil bone there. There's a lot of advantages to that. You don't have to worry as much about the bones being damaged. I have to imagine air conditioning while you're doing that painstaking work would have to be a big plus as well. That kind of work is not done in the field by paleontologists. Archaeologists who say study human civilizations, they might do the kind of thing seen in this movie, but not dinosaur scientists. Now, another sort of interesting thing is, if you were to find the fossils of one individual dinosaur. If you could find like a third of the bones from that individual animal's body, that would be considered a really, really great find. If you could find two-thirds of the bones from one individual animal, that would be phenomenal. That would be a famous fossil. The most complete Tyrannosaurus rex that's ever been discovered, they found 70% of her bones, all from the same individual. That dinosaur, they even gave her a name. They called her Tyrannosaurus Sue. She has museum exhibits dedicated solely to her. Now, in Jurassic Park, on more than one occasion, they find what appears to be 100% of the bones from one animal, and it's nothing but a thing. No one is high-fiving like, oh yeah, there it all is. <laughs> wow! They must be much more successful than I had realized. Now, probably the most famous error about the Velociraptors in this movie and it's one that, when I tell it to children, a lot of times they absolutely refuse to believe me that this could be so. And it has to do with how big the velociraptors were. 
Now, if you measured from the front of their nose to the tip of the tail, they were about six feet long, but not very tall. With their kind of slouchy posture, the sort of leaning over attitude, at the hip, they were about 18 inches tall. And if they stood fully erect, straight up and down like a person, we're talking maybe two to three feet tall. Let me give you an example. So, oops, stay together, little dude. So this here is a life-size model of full adult velociraptor. Oh, yes. So the part that they actually kind of mock somebody for, comparing them in size to a wild turkey, that's pretty accurate. If you were somehow being chased by a velociraptor, giving them a good swift kick would probably be a pretty good defense against them. <laughs> uh, to give you an idea of how big they are in the movie, take a look during the kitchen scene when one of them stands straight up right next to a doorway, which I'm going to have to assume is about six and a half feet tall. Now, in some ways, and again, why did Michael Crichton do this? I, I, I'm not sure. But the velociraptors in this movie seem a little more based on a related animal, another species of dromosaurid called the Deinonychus. Maybe he didn't go with that because it would be tough to yell, look out for the Deinonychus. Yeah, okay, well, whatever. <laughs> Deinonychus also was not quite as big as the velociraptors in this movie, but it was closer. They were closer to human size. Standing fully upright, they'd be a little shorter than me, so closer. Uh, and Deinonychus also was found in Montana and other places in the Midwest. And just to make it even weirder, while Jurassic Park was being filmed, in the state of Utah, they found another dromosaur that they named the Utahraptor, who is even bigger than the Velociraptors in this movie. Utahraptor probably stood about eight feet tall and weighed probably over a thousand pounds. How come no one has put that animal in any movie? Seriously, how come? <laughs> no one knows how well. Stay there, little dude. And there are a few other somewhat more minor things that weren't correct. Like all the dinosaurs in this movie, velociraptors are depicted as being scaly like reptiles. To be fair, this part was not known when the movie was made, but velociraptor did have feathers. They are closely related to birds, and structurally, scales are very similar to feathers anyway. They're basically modified scales. Now, I admit I have not seen the movie we're about to see in a while, so I'm going to pay attention to see if this is done correctly. Last year when Jurassic World came out, one scientist pointed out that sometimes there's mistakes in the way the velociraptors are shown holding their hands. I rewatched it and sometimes this is shown correctly and sometimes it's not. With the special bones they had in the wrist, they couldn't hold their hands like this, face down. They would have to hold them facing inward. The guy they quoted in the newspaper said, imagine them holding a basketball. That, that's pretty much the kind of thing they would do. So like I said, that was sometimes right, sometimes not right in the most recent movie. I'll check to see what it is here. The velociraptors, like a lot of dinosaurs, did use their tails for balance. But, <clears throat> excuse me, the bones in their tails were fused. So their tails would have been rigid. They could have moved them back and forth like the rudder on a plane, but they couldn't have moved them around. In Jurassic World, at least, they're clearly basing the way the raptors move their tails on cats. And they simply couldn't, they could not do that kind of movement there. Just not happening. And then we get to a few things that are, uh, some things are more probable than others, and some things are easier to know than others. Now, there's a lot of controversy, not just with velociraptors, but with a lot of dinosaurs about how fast they were. T-Rex notably for that. By checking out the size of their legs, by looking how far apart footprints were, by applying the modern science of biomechanics, scientists can come up with an estimate of how fast extinct animals move, but it's still sort of a rough estimate. In Jurassic Park, it states that the velociraptors could move like as fast as cheetahs. We're talking 60 miles an hour. That's probably an overstatement there. A small animal going that fast seems unlikely. And somewhat oddly, because in many ways it was worse with the paleontology, but last year in Jurassic World, they toned that down a little bit and said they could go 40 miles an hour. <laughs> that might be more accurate. That seems more possible. And to put that in perspective, 
In a couple months, when you're watching Usain Bolt and the rest of the sprinters in the Olympics, they're going about 25 miles an hour. So respect to the Raptors for that speed part there. <laughs> yeah. There are lots of times when smaller animals will gang up on bigger animals, and it's not just predators either. Take birds, for example. Small, non-carnivorous birds like finches or titmice or sparrows, if they see a predator like, say, a raptor, like a hawk, they'll do something called mobbing. A whole bunch of them will go after the big guy and attack them. That being said, one scene in this movie where just two velociraptors attack a much larger predator seems kind of borderline suicidal. I don't know if they would really have acted like that. Dr. Grant also has a memorable scene where he describes in beautifully, beautifully disgusting detail about how the raptors might slice open your guts and start ripping out your innards while you're still alive. Mmm, delicious. I have to assume. I, not that I know. <clears throat> That, uh, that seems like a sort of but not exactly kind of thing. With birds of prey today, they do have big talons, very sharp claws on their feet, and their toes are very strong, so they can grip things really hard and sink their talons in pretty deep. In a lot of cases, if they are grabbing a small animal like another bird or a rodent, that might just kill the prey outright. But if they grab a somewhat larger animal and that doesn't kill them, then they will use their talons to hold on to it and try to pin the animal down with their body weight and then start tearing at it with their beak. The thing is, they pretty much do not start eating until the prey is dead. And the reason for that is, it's not easy being a predator. One of the biggest dangers they face is that if they kill an animal, they've expended a lot of energy getting that animal dead, then some other bigger predator might come and take the food away from them. An animal that's still alive with a big gut wound that's an animal that's going to be shrieking and squealing and moaning and making lots of noise. That will attract the other predators who hear someone wounded and want a piece of that action. So killing your prey as quickly and efficiently as possible, generally a good idea. Oh, a really slippery issue has to do with how smart the velociraptors are. In the movies, they are portrayed as the geniuses of the dinosaur world. Wow, can they do a lot of stuff. That is a very slippery slope for trying to figure out. Even defining what intelligent or smart means is very difficult, and people generally don't agree on it. Trying to figure out how smart or intelligent animals are is even more difficult. And trying to figure out how smart animals that are extinct are and that no one has ever seen alive, that's really hard. Now, the gold standard for that used to be comparing the size of the animal's brain to the size of the body. Comparing the brain-body ratio they thought would give you a pretty good benchmark for how smart they are. Now, if you went with that, velociraptors did have some of the best ratios amongst the dinosaurs. Some of the really big dinosaurs did have really tiny brains. On the other hand, the velociraptor's brain-body ratio was comparable to some modern-day animals like, say, ostriches, who, eh, they're not exactly a pack of rocket scientists or anything there. <laughs> But most scientists today don't really go with the ratio as much of a standard. They consider it, at best, a rough approximation, and at worst, just totally useless. The whole reason that measurement started in the first place was because after doing the math, some people figured out that the animal with the best brain-to-body ratio, so we decided to use that to prove how much smarter we were than everyone else. <laughs> It's possible that the raptors would have been smart enough to do some of the things they show in the movie. Learning how to open doors, it can't be that hard because I've known some pretty dumb dogs who have figured that out. They just see someone do it. And as I mentioned, velociraptors were closely related to birds. And like a lot of animals, they might have had very specialized brains. Maybe they were dumb at some stuff, but really good at some other stuff. For example, some birds today, like ravens, Shockingly intelligent. They've been able to do problem solving things like figuring out how to use simple machines like pulleys. And when you think about it, taking a look at something and saying, I want that thing to move up. So to do that, I'm going to make something else move down. That shows some kind of thinking is going on there. Or to cite another bird, there are people who compete in what's known as mental sports. Like there are people who do actual competitions to test memory. 
Some of these memory athletes have been able to do things like remembering a string of uh, numbers that's 500 digits long. Good luck with trying that at home. And yet, that's for people with our supposedly awesome brains and all. There's one bird that lives in the western United States called the Clark's Nutcracker that eats seeds out of pine cones and other things. And because they don't migrate, they live in the mountains in the west, as they're eating, they often take a few seeds and stash them in some hidey place somewhere, under a rock, inside a hole, inside some tree bark. And they've been observed making over a thousand different seed stashes. And then, months later, when the whole landscape looks different because it's covered with three feet of snow, they can still remember where those things are. So, it is possible the raptors may have had some special skills that would have been pretty impressive. Now, one other thing that has been cemented in people's minds about velociraptors from the Jurassic Park movies is that they were pack hunters, that they worked together, they cooperated and came up with a plan for how to bring down their prey. That's really unknown whether that's true. For a velociraptor, there's just no evidence that that was so. It could have been, but no one has found any evidence of that. For Deinonychus, maybe there's a little evidence, but not anything conclusive. It's very difficult to really tell what they were doing just by the fossils. Even if you find a whole bunch of animals around one prey animal, that doesn't necessarily mean they, co they were cooperating. Imagine if a deer gets hit by a car and it's lying by the side of the road, a whole bunch of vultures will go in and start eating. They didn't work together to get that food, they just all decided to chow down at the same time. Uh, most animals today that hunt cooperatively are mammals, wolves, lions, some kinds of whales. The dinosaurs were closer to birds and they're not as much on the cooperation. Although there is one species of raptor today called the Harris's hawk that lives in southwest U.S. and into Mexico where they do use wolf-like cooperation where a whole bunch of them will come up with a plan to bring down a large prayer like a jackrabbit. So, it could have happened, but really, no one knows for sure on that. All right, well, I know everyone wants to start the movie, so let me just say that if anyone has any questions or wants to take a closer look at my skull, or, well, not my skull, but the skull there, I'll be sticking around after the movie. Thanks again very much for having me out to speak about the dinosaurs today, everybody. Thanks very much.